This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 166. Most of the folks who listen to this show work on products and publications that reach audiences around the world. That global reach is one of the many benefits of the technical and social infrastructure that we call the World Wide Web. For a variety of reasons, the main language on the web is English, even when content is localized for different regions. Michael Reed has thought a lot about the privilege bestowed upon native English speakers in this situation. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 166 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I am really happy today to welcome to the show Michael Reed. Michael is a linguistic and cultural equity consultant. He's based in Athens, Greece. He's an American guy, but he's uh, uh, um, does really interesting work here. So welcome, Michael. Tell the folks a little bit more about your work as a consultant. Thank you so much for having me. So my work, I, I guess what I'll do is I'll start with my origin story. That sounds a little grandiose. I'm not a superhero or anything like that, but <laughs> I'll start with that. And then I think that can contextualize things a bit. I started out in linguistics, the French linguistics. That was my my major, my undergrad. And after I graduated with uh, my French linguistics major and Japanese linguistics minor, I became a translator and interpreter of Japanese and English or Japanese, French and English. And mostly I was focused actually on interpretation. I worked in social services. I was in the courts and hospitals. And after doing that for about six years, having my own business, I decided to move into higher education because I really liked the interaction with people. So I became a language professor. And a couple, three years after that, I became an administrator. I was the, the coordinator for a study abroad program and then later transitioned into doing that as well as being the director of international recruitment at the institution where I was working. And then parallel to all of that, I was sitting and occasionally chairing the boards of several nonprofit organizations that worked in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And I was developing and presenting a series of workshops on cross-cultural communication, competency, humility, that kind of thing. And what I noticed as I was doing it, like I sort of came into this, I had always been in the language field and I had always been in the DEI field. And I thought of them as natural allies, but the deeper I got into those fields and tried to cross what I thought was a pre-constructed bridge, I realized the two sides didn't really talk to each other as much as I expected they would, right? So we had international business and education over here that already thought it was diverse because it had the word international in its name. It's like, okay, you're diverse, kind of, still have some work to do there, but you're not really that inclusive and still have some work to do there. But then you would look over and, you know, because I, I want to be fair, because I've, I've got lots to say about the language industry, but I've got some things to say about DEI, too, because you would look at DEI, especially in the U.S., and it would act as if the United States was the only place where people were talking about these issues and as if it were the only place where these issues would even be appropriate. And crucially, as if English were the only language in which these issues were being discussed, which is patently false. So it became my mission, I like to say, to decolonize DEI, to make sure that we don't put French solutions on Japanese problems, right? Because when we're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need to do it in a way that really resonates with and is responsive to the history, the culture, the language, the society of the people that we're working with. Otherwise, it's not going to land for them, right? If you went to a group of people who were coming from a US cultural context and said, okay, I'm going to help you understand this concept about diversity or inclusivity by talking about um, expelling the British Raj from India, people would be like, that doesn't have anything to do with our lived experience though, right? Like for an American audience, you're going to want to talk about Malcolm X, you're going to want to talk about Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, that kind of thing. Cesar Chavez, with with a Japanese audience, though, if I use those same people I just mentioned, that's not going to resonate with them. So I'm going to have to speak to them in a different way, using different references and that kind of thing. So, yeah, if, if we try to do DEI in a way that doesn't respect the fact that people come from different cultural backgrounds, then we're not really doing DEI. 
we're just sort of imposing an idea on people or talking at them at best. So that that is how I came into to what I do. Well, that's a, you know that's a really interesting overlay on the concerns and interests of my folks because we're all like you know we're all word nerds and you know interested in language and culture increasingly because we're all sort of you know the the internet and the web where most of us work is global and international and and um, there's a whole thing there about globalization versus localization which we can talk about a little bit I hope um, you know um, and plus it's in a business context you mentioned like that a lot of the in, in, uh, the um, the the linguistic you know that that sort of uh, cultural competency in business and 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 anyhow and I think your story also like every little t- part of your story you're, you're still like to me I've got you in my head now as like that that super interesting dude at college you know who knew like was doing a lot of different stuff but it's also like that gives you the ability to like uh, to like speak specifically to the interests of a lot of different things that my folks are up to but hey let me tell you about why I mean I, I just share with the folks how I we came to connect and why I had you on the show. You did this fantastic conversation with uh, Rahime Ramzani, Ramazani on um, the problem of English language privilege in DEI a while back. And my story is I recently moved to the Netherlands about six months ago, which and w- there's two things that ensue from that. One is like I'm hanging out with many more content designers and content professionals in Europe. And over here, the concerns and interests and backgrounds of folks are way different. They all come from like localization is the pathway into content professions, whereas in the U.S. it's mostly <clears throat> copywriting, journalism, that kind of thing. Um, so there's that. And also my personal experience living in the Netherlands, it's like this is the worst place in the world, you know, or the best place in the world to benefit from English language privilege because it's a small country. Dutch is kind of a hard language to learn. Nobody's going to learn it just to do business. With them. So they all speak English. So I am like living every Every day, this problem that you describe so eloquently and can deal with, you know, that I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm just horrible. I'm just a horrible person for not for not having learned Dutch yet after six months. Um, <clears throat> but but anyhow, the, one of the main things out of that, and I think it will be really uh, my folks will be curious about that notion of like localization. That mm-hmm. to me is a super interesting thing. We think in the digital design world. You know that we've come up with the ideal way to negotiate an experience or to or to you know explain something to somebody, and then you just have to put it in another language, maybe contextualize it for a culture a little bit. Um, I, I, tell me about how English language privilege might manifest in those kind of situations. So there are there are a few ways. The one of the ways that I'm thinking about right now is the use of English as a pivot language. And what I see that doing, and just for those who don't know, I'm sure most do, what we talk about in linguistics or in language um, services when we talk about a pivot language is using a language as basically an intermediary between two other languages when you don't think you can reliably find somebody in that particular pair. So, for example, just to use something close to home for me, say you were unable to find somebody who speaks both French and uh, Japanese. I I do. And there are many, many other people who speak French and Japanese, but just say you couldn't. Well, then you say, okay, we'll take this Japanese content, translate it into English, and then have the French come out of the English content. What does that do? That privileges people who have English either to either at a native level or a very highly functional level. It introduces massive potential for mistranslation, misunderstandings, um, just poor localization, really, because you're taking it from one cultural context, encoding it in a different ling- uh, social cultural context, let's call it that, and all the linguistic, metalinguistic, and paralinguistic things that that implies, and then you're taking it from that into yet another one. So, the, you know, it in- introduces a massive potential for error, for misunderstanding, and then when we get to the, you know, so just that's the that's the logistic part of it. That's the part of it where we're looking and saying, OK, we're not coming up with a good product, really. Right. Um, and there are a whole bunch of moral and ethical implications with that. But even if you just want to look at it, which I rarely do, but even if you just want to look at it from a, a strictly sort of amoral, is this product going to make me money perspective? It may some, but are you really providing the best, most effective, most attractive product? No, you're not. Because believe me, you can often tell when a product has been localized 
in a sort of like playing game of telephone or just sort of a shoddy manner. The other thing, though, the, the privilege comes in where, A, it necessitates and encourages focusing on English to the at the expense of other languages. For example, a translator who wants to get, maybe you've got a French translator, right, who is really passionate about Japanese, but they know there's not much work in the French-Japanese language pair, but they know there's a lot in the French-English pair, so they're going to focus on English, right? So it encourages them to direct their efforts toward English. Meanwhile, now we've got a whole bunch of work that people who are working natively from English, native uh, English speakers, are going to be, and excuse me, I've turned this around a little bit. So you've got a, a French translator who maybe is really passionate about Japanese translating from Japanese into French. They don't focus on Japanese, so they focus on English so they can translate into French. So you've got that going on they've they've been incentivized to do that and then you've got native uh english translators english speaking translators who are going to be translating from the french into you know whatever so you you create this system where where people are like i said incentivized to go from english into their native language, whatever other language they may might have passion for. And then you've got sort of, like I say, this, this ready-made massive work for people who are translating into English, right? So the people who are native English speaking translators translating into English from whatever language, cool. They, they've got their, you know, they've got themselves set up. Good for them. But they're getting even more work because their native language is you know used as a pivot language and the fact that their native language is being used as a pivot language is incentivizing other translators to to work from that language so that that's one way we see it in localization admittedly it is not the the most obvious place that we see it in localization though that's just sort of a a small area to be honest and and there are admittedly nuances that we have to think about in terms of the the exposure uh, that people have to English from a young age. So, you know, there are a lot of people who, you know, I, in, in the way I sort of frame it, I'm conceiving of somebody who was really interested in Japanese or really interested in Greek or whatever, but they went to English because that's where they knew the work was. The reality is a lot of people willingly will turn toward English because they've had so much early exposure. It's a lower barrier to entry. They may have a natural affinity for it too, you know, that, which is, is totally legitimate. But I think an even greater um, area that we can see this kind of thing popping up is when we look at, and, and I'm gonna give a particular example here, and I don't mean to be to be coming for anybody, but I think it's it's just sort of a good way to encapsulate what we're talking about. If you use the YouTube app on a smart TV in Greek, which we do in our house, you will notice that it does a terrible job rendering the Greek alphabet. The there there are some letters in Greek that are in different forms. If it comes at the beginning or middle or the end of the word, um, the you know there are things like this. It ignores that completely. Um, the vowels come up as Latin character vowels instead of Greek vowels. It's just it it just looks terrible when you're trying to when you're trying to enter something in Greek, and because of that, it'll give you weird results occasionally. What does that mean? That means clearly nobody on the dev team and nobody even in the final sign off was a Greek speaker for the Greek UI of the YouTube app, which, what does that tell us? Okay, one, let's look at the, the ads that we see for localization positions. How many of them, it's most, spoiler alert, how many of them say must have an excellent command of English, knowledge of another language is an asset? Which, let's think about that for a second. You are in the business of turning one content a content in one language 
into content in another language with all of the linguistic and again, metalinguistic and paralinguistic things that that implies. And you're only required to know one language and every other language is an asset, which automatically privileges obviously native English speakers because they don't have to do anything extra to get into that position. Everybody else does, they don't. And then we see the result of that. If the only thing you've required of the people on your localization team is to know English, then you're going to get things like a Greek interface that can't even write Greek properly because you didn't require people to know Greek to be in that position. So that that to me is, is are those are some of the biggest um, examples of English language. No, and as you're saying that too, I'm realizing there's um, I've very few and I have a few, but very few executives among my my listeners. And that so I think for the most part, people are going to be stuck with like you know, for example, decision around how well you know like how many resources and what strategy you take to localize. There's everything from like simple machine translation out to like pure co-creation, you know, at the, mm-hmm. the, you know, in, in the culture, but it sounds like most places, even Google, come on, you have all the money in the world, hire a Greek speaker for crying out loud. Um, right. But right. so I guess for pragmatically for my folks, like one of the things is, as you're talking, like, and I don't know about meta and paralinguistics, but is that in the same family as linguistics? <laughs> I mean, as, yes. as, as semantics, yeah. as semantics, yeah. because what I'm thinking about is like, the hope is that you're conveying the same meaning in different mm-hmm. languages and cultural contexts. Do we have a chance to do that in the current, you know, the current business and, and uh, social setup? I think we have a chance to do it. Let me say it like this. I know that we have a chance to do it because we do see it being done successfully occasionally, which clearly means that the chance exists. Otherwise, we, we just wouldn't see successful examples of it. I would say, however, that we are reducing our chances of doing it successfully the way that we have things set up because we have a system that, when you have a system that is heavily turned toward valorizing or prioritizing one set of skills, And you don't realize that there's all these other skills. Oh, you know, so say this is your focus, but around here are all these other skills that are actually crucial to the to the successful execution of your focus. Then, yes, accidentally, you know, occasionally just statistics says you're going to, you know, occasionally hit the target. But you haven't created a system that is going to actively or proactively bring in all of these other surrounding skills into into uh, achieving the goal that you're looking for. So, you know, we're focusing so much on being able to speak English and can you, what is your English level and can you speak English and, you know, other, other languages are an asset and that kind of thing. And what we've created a situation where people are, again, incentivized to focus on this one skill, which then gets other people thinking that that is the important skill and everything else can kind of just be, you know, it, it, it's uh, a matter of less importance. And that that clearly is going to affect the quality of, of what you come up with. And so, yeah, we have a, do we have a chance? Yes. But I would say right now, good localization is... More of, I know it's the goal, but the way the system is set up, it's more of an accidental result um, than an actual feature of the system. I think, I think we see good localization in spite of the system that we have, not because of the system that we have. Let me say it like that. That sounds both accurate and tragic at the same time. Um, and one of the things that occurs to me, you know, I, as you were talking, you, were, you reminded me of something you said in that that conversation with Rahime um, about uh, that less than 20% of the world even speaks English. Mm-hmm. So like from a pragmatic business perspective, like there's this thing in the startup world of the total addressable market, you know, like how many, right. like you just limit it to like 19% of the world just by taking this English. And I mean, there's, there's obviously a whole lot to this, but, um, but that, that notion of like, um, and a lot of what you're talking about makes, you know, is, is just seems amplified by that statistic. 
that like mm-hmm. we're we we're claiming to be and i guess and part of this too and i'm kind of circling around to another thing that i'm obligated to talk about in the year 2023 is a, is a artificial intelligence and mm-hmm. the large learning models that drive these uh, generative ai things mm-hmm. they don't have any of that stuff in there i'm going to guess that other 80 percent is that they do but in very the, this is another massive area where we see where we see English language. Um, I we see a an English language dominance. Let's say it like that, which leads to an English language privilege. Um, my experience, you know, and I'll just speak from my experience. For example, when I was playing around with Chat GPT and tried to get it to give me just a a simple paragraph describing DEI work in English. It didn't know. It wasn't, it wasn't great. Like it wasn't one of those texts that you read and it's like, it was no letter from a Birmingham jail. Let's just say it like that. It was, it was serviceable as just kind of boilerplate, basic DEI stuff. Cool. I tried to get it to do the same in Greek. And it spit out something that was intelligible, but with these errors that you would never make. It had gender agreement errors. It had um, person and number agreement errors, like, you know, subject verb agreement errors. It, It was just a mess. And, you know, again, was it passable? Could you read it and get the basic sense out of it? Yes, you could. Was it even grammatically correct? No, it wasn't. Excuse me. And that is because these models are trained on so much English data. And then what we have is this assumption, and and really, maybe there's a little, little bit of a chicken egg problem. Maybe this came from the assumption, and so yet we see yet another problem of of English language dominance or any single language dominance. We're talking about English because English is, in people's minds, the dominant language. But if it were French, we'd be talking about French. If it were any other language, we'd be talking about that language. We see this issue where basically the English data is made to stand in for the whole, right? It's made to stand in as the default, right? So that that introduces a lot of problems and you would think it'd be just like you know oh well what it means is that you can't get a grammatically text a grammatically correct text in greek out but that's not all it means though it because there are going to be certain conceptions of the world how the world is divided especially legally and politically that are going to be different right for example put a whole bunch of training data from um, from the US, say, or from the UK or whatever, into, into these large language models. And they are going to call the, the sea just off of Japan, the sea of Japan, right? The sea, the, the sea that is between Japan and the Korean peninsula. We're going to call it the sea of Japan, right? If you train that same large language model on Korean data, They'd be calling it the Eastern Sea because they don't call it the Sea of Japan. So it's not just the language. It is the way things are named. It is the way the world is sort of cut up that's going to be different on that too. So you can't just use data in one language and think that that stands in for the entirety of human knowledge. It, It manifestly doesn't. And there's a major problem with thinking that it does. And there's a major problem with the thinking that gets us to the place where we don't even consider that until kind of the horse is already out of the barn. Yep. You're reminding me now of like, you're right in my my audience's sweet spot of like that, you know, you have things and you're labeling them. And mm-hmm. like that C, some people call it one thing, some people call it another. Um, and that, and I also, I do a lot of work in the um, kind of knowledge representation world in the AI world around knowledge graphs and, and ontologies and stuff. And that, and also I'm super interested in like the the anthropological or the the social the notion of boundary objects like in that case that body of water is a boundary object that's perceived by japanese people one way and korean people another way Uh um which kind of gets back to that semantic thing i asked about earlier it's like 
I don't know. Do we have like what's our best shot at like because everybody in this field is like earnest and committed and serious about including as many people as possible in the digital experiences they're creating. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess is like is there any like I you know I hate this like a three point list or you know like a take home <laughs> about like you know it's, I I hate that but that idea but just that notion of like tips and tricks and just um, you know lessons from the world of your world of linguistics and and inclusion that might help people um, you know both understand that different people look at things differently and that your attempt to do it in your native language is going to fall short and how can you you know how can you best pick up the you know try to make up that difference i think in terms of examples of how again you can't just use one one lens um right it's it's what in fact do i have the book i thought i had the book behind me i don't um but there's an author who says that basically the the danger of uh, a stereotype is not that it's incomplete, but that it, this I'm paraphrasing, but it's not that it's incomplete, it's that it's inaccurate, or I'm sorry, that it's inaccurate, is that it's incomplete. In other words, it makes one story the only story, right? Um, and I think it came from a talk entitled The Danger of a Single Story. And that's the thing. That's the danger that we're in right now is we are treating one language as a stand in for all of the languages. And this just circles right back around to what we were talking about with pivot language, using English as a pivot language, right? Because we're using it as if it were sort of the Rosetta Stone slash crucible into which we can just input, you know, whatever from whatever language. And then we can just take out of that into whatever language with, again, the impact that that has on non-native English speakers sort of being incentivized to go to English and then uh, creating this massive amount of content in English because there's more demand for English content, right? Because, for example, in in, the, in what I was saying earlier, the, the content that the job, in other words, the work that would have gone to the Japanese translator from from French is now going to the English translator, right? Because it's coming from French into English. And then the Japanese translator is maybe going to get that work from English into Japanese, but at, you know, at what rate? Because now they're, they're, how far down the food chain, quote unquote, are they? There's all these issues that come into that. Um, So that, in other words, how to illustrate the danger of that? I just gave one example. I think another very, very pertinent, two pertinent examples and they are DEI related, are racial categories. Now, the, one of the biggest proofs that race is a social construct is that your race, quote unquote, can change just by crossing a border, right? So, for example, in the U.S., where I was born, I identify as as Black because that is, you know, when I'm in the U.S., I know that's how I code. That's That's how I go. I carry that identity with me but it doesn't translate, quote unquote, no pun intended, the same way in Greece. I, my my in-laws have said to me repeatedly, but Michael, you're not black. Because for them, black is a certain set of features. You know, they're, they're, when they think of black, they're thinking of somebody who is from ni- directly from Nigeria or Kenya, right? Or something like that. They aren't thinking african-american biracial all of that kind of thing you know they've, they've got a particular thing in mind they look at me and they're like hey you you know you just look like a southern greek guy in the summer what <laughs> so but yeah and it, it's it's one of those stories that's funny but it points us at something the way we look at these categories is very very culturally determined And so if you put in a bunch of data that says people that look like this are this, people that look like this are this, and it's from one cultural perspective, that's not going to translate the same in another language Um, and in another another culture. What are some of the things that can be done about it? I'm about to make probably my least popular suggestion, but this is is very DEI-based. And it's always the suggestion that goes over the hardest. 
no matter what I'm talking about, especially though, when I'm talking to executives, this is the one that they go, oh, oh, okay, sure. Um, which is for those of you who are in a privileged position, and in this case, privilege defined by having English as your first or very uh, high, highly uh, proficient language, is to actively work to dismantle what privileges you. And here's what I mean by this. And everybody goes, ooh, wait a second. That sounds like less power for me. Yes, yes, that is exactly what I mean. Just, just in case anybody was wondering, does he really mean? Yes, he really means less power for you. Um, because I have seen people in, much love to all of you, but I have seen people in the localization industry who are not functionally multilingual, who are in monolingual Anglophones. They are not functionally monolingual. They uh, very occasionally, and I know it is not without malice, but they will occasionally sort of try to advocate for the lack of necessity of learning other languages to be able to do their job. And my first reaction is, okay, your colleague from Mexico, did they get that? Did they get that uh, that luxury? Did they get to not learn English? and get your job because you didn't have to do anything else other than be good at your job. That's the thing. I am never saying somebody who's a native English speaker is not good at their job. What I'm saying is that they are Fred Astaire to their colleagues, Ginger Rogers. Let's say it like that, right? It was the whole Fred. What is Fred Astaire? He's this wonderful dancer. Da, da, da. What does Ginger Rogers do? Everything he does, but backwards and in heels. Your colleagues who don't have English as a native language do everything you do. They're just as good at you as your job. You're excellent at your job. They're similarly excellent. They have to be excellent in another language. You just had to show up excellent. They had to show up excellent, having learned your language to get their foot in the door. So if you are in that position, Question it, interrogate it, say, hey, why, why wasn't I required to learn another language? Maybe I should start learning another language. Oh, but it's hard. Oh, but it takes time. Oh, yes, that is all true. And it was hard and took time for your colleagues as well. Why is the burden shifted? Because we talk a lot about this in DEI, about burden shifting, right? And burden, um, uh, burden shifting and focus, shifting and impact shifting. Why is the burden on your colleagues to have done that work and not you? How did you get exempted from it? And then people will say, you know, of course, well, that's just the way things are. Just, I mean, I don't know which that's just the way things are when we're not talking about some emergent property of the cosmos is just to me a major cop out because we create the way things are right it, the privilege of English is no more the way things are than the fact that my father couldn't sit at the same lunch counter as everybody else when he was a child. That was not, the, it was the way things were, but people made it the way things were. It is the same thing with English. If you look at what was being talked about by Teddy Roosevelt, by Winston Churchill, by all of these Anglophone leaders who had this vested interest in the promotion of English, you realize it wasn't really an accident. There was some thought that went into this. And I'm not saying there's some grand conspiracy or English cabal behind things. No, that's silly. But the fact of the matter is, this isn't a system that just grew up out of the ground like a birch tree. It's a system that we made. And by interrogating it, by questioning why certain people have those privileges and certain people don't, and by working to dismantle some of our own privileges, then we can move toward a system that is not just more more just and more fair which is the key goal but the nice um collateral benefit of that is that we'll be actually doing our jobs better we'll be doing localization better we'll be doing translation better we'll be doing content creation we'll be doing media better if we do it that way because we'll have more stories contributing to that 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 mass of human knowledge. Nice. You couldn't have known this, I don't think, but my very first episode of this podcast was a guy named Hanson Hussein. And I had, I started this whole podcast because he said, you know, does the world really need any more stories? And from what you just said, I'm like, yes, we need many more stories. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> hey, thanks, Mike. Michael, I can't believe it. We're coming up close to on time for the episode, but is there anything last, anything you want to make sure we share before we wrap up? 
I think the last thing I want to say is just sort of a reiteration, really, of of what I have just said. You know, I know some of us are are allergic to thinking about our own privilege for various reasons, and a lot of them understandable. It can kind of bring up unpleasant feelings sometimes. I think about my privilege in the fact that I have a U.S. passport. I think about my privilege in the fact that I am a native English speaker, in the fact that I'm not disabled, and I live in a neighborhood with really uneven sidewalks, but I don't have to worry about it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think about those things a lot, and and I think, okay, what can I do to make this better? Um, I, so I know it's uncomfortable to think about our privilege, but I think it is absolutely vital to do so. It's the, let me say it like this. It's, it becomes a, a, a moral obligation in the sense that we are not just looking at what does the system do to others that we are directly impacting. In other words, the people on whom we're shifting the burden of learning other languages. But then we have to also look at the ancillary effects that might not seem to be connected, but actually are. For example, you're, you know, you're talking about living in the Netherlands and you haven't learned Dutch yet, which, okay, that's, you know, that's, that, that is not, that's hardly the, the greatest sin you could, you could commit. But let's think about it this way. If you move to the Netherlands and you didn't speak English either, but you spoke Somali or you spoke Arabic, would you have as many chances for success? Would you be welcomed as much? Would you be received as warmly? That's the that's the other issue. It's not just about you are expecting Dutch people to know English. It is that other people who come in also not knowing Dutch, but not knowing English, crucially, are not going to have the same reception that you do. So it's, it's this widening um these these ripples of effects that that hit farther than we even imagined so to try somewhat uh unsuccessfully to be brief i would say what i would really encourage people to do is not from a place of guilt not from a place of shame that does nobody any good and again most people are acting with mal malice so they don't deserve it but to really start interrogating how is it that we got to this place? What privileges do I have that other people don't have? And what can I reasonably do? And that answer might be different for everybody. But what can I reasonably do, me as an individual in my situation, to, to make the situation better? It might be learning the language of the place where you live. It might be... Um, just deciding to learn another language that you know a lot of your colleagues speak. It might be advocating for your colleagues who don't have English as a first language. It, you know how it's going to look is going to be really different. It might be advocating to make sure that you have people that speak the language in which a product is going to be released on the dev team of that product, for example. Uh, but you know it's going to be that kind of thing. It's it's taking that critical interrogative eye toward your positionality and your processes and saying, okay, where are things working? And working not just in a, in a profitable sense, but in an ethical and a moral sense. And where are things not working? And where they're not working, what can I do to improve it? Nice. Thanks so much, Michael. That That's exactly, that. that's like a brilliant punctuation mark on this whole conversation. Um, thanks. Hey, one very last thing. Uh, what's the best way for folks if they want to follow you or connect online uh, to, to reach you? Um, I am a nobody on most social media platforms, but you can find me on, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find me at my website, which is Aleph to Omega.com. It's not, you're hearing it right. It's Aleph, the first letter of the Arabic, uh, script and Omega, the last letter of the Greek script. So A L I F T O Omega M O L O M E G A.com. Um, and you can email me at michael at, at aleftoomega.com as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I really enjoyed this conversation a lot. And thank you. I loved it. It was great. Thank you so much, Larry. 
Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.